I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 1, considering verses 1 to 8 this morning. This is God's inerrant word written to you. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we attend to the preaching of your word, would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see the glory of your gospel, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, in the first sermon on the gospel of Mark, we noted um, in verse 1 how that verse served as really a signal to us, to the readers, that this new age was dawning. That's what Mark means when he says in verse 1 there, the beginning of the gospel. Uh, He's calling our attention to this new stage of redemptive history, uh, this this messianic age that's upon us, the age of the Messiah. It has finally come. He's saying Christ, the Christ who was promised by the prophets, has finally come to accomplish that mission given to him by the Father before the foundation of the world, that mission in which he would deliver his people from their sins and establish his heavenly reign here on earth. But even though Mark designates this new era as the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this era does not begin with the ministry of Jesus. We're not actually introduced to Jesus until verse 9 when he's baptized, which is the event that officially launches his earthly ministry. Verses 2 to 8 show us that there's someone else who comes before Jesus, someone who doesn't get that much attention uh, despite playing a significant role in redemption, and that is John the Baptist. Uh, The era of the gospel begins not with the ministry of Jesus, but with the ministry of John. As we'll see, their ministries are very much interconnected and dependent upon one another, but John's ministry precedes and even paves the way for the ministry of Christ. And so this morning, we're going to take a closer look at John the Baptist and his unique calling, the unique calling placed upon him by the Lord. Look again at verses 2 and 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now this is an interesting couple of verses because they're actually a combination of two separate passages, one from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3, the other from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Uh, The first is from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 where God promises to his people to send this messenger, the Lord's messenger, as a forerunner who will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, of the Christ. And then in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, we're told that a voice is crying in the wilderness, announcing to the people of Israel the coming of the Lord. And so the verse in Malachi really helps to explain, further explain that verse in Isaiah, showing us that the voice that cries in the wilderness is in fact the voice of God's appointed messenger. Uh, These Old Testament texts then promise two things, really, that a messenger is coming to God's people and that God himself is coming to his people. The promised messenger functions as this herald who is calling the Jews to prepare themselves for the arrival of their king, who will deliver them from bondage. And though Mark doesn't reference this verse, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, that verse sheds further light on the identity of this mysterious messenger. 
Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so Malachi identifies this herald as the prophet Elijah. And now we know from Mark chapter, verse, or chapter 9, as well as the other Gospels, that it wasn't Elijah himself who came. It wasn't as if God resurrected Elijah or if, as if Elijah was reincarnated in some sense. No, it was another prophet, but who functioned in very much the same way as Elijah. He filled an Elijah-like role. And that prophet is John the Baptist. And so let's zoom out on verses 2 and 3 and get the big picture of what's unfolding here. Mark is saying that the day of Israel's salvation and restoration that's anticipated in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, that day is now here. All of history has been progressively moving forward to this moment in time when the promised Messiah, the Son of David, the ruler of Israel, would come to save His people. We know the King is coming. Mark writes, because the king's herald has come in the person of John the Baptist. John is, is the wilderness prophet who cries out to the Jews to prepare themselves for the coming of the Lord. And so the appearance of John in the wilderness signals to the Jews that the Old Testament Scriptures are literally being fulfilled before their very eyes, and that great day of redemption is upon them. That is the big picture of what's happening in our text. And now before we dive into the particulars of John's ministry, verses 4 to 8, I want to take a slight detour because there's an important hermeneutical point to be made with verses 2 and 3. Now hermeneutics, uh, it sounds like a nasty disease. It is not. Um, hermeneutics actually refers to the science of biblical interpretation. Okay, when you and I read the Bible, we all bring a bag of tools with us to help us understand what we are reading, and you do this whether you're aware of it or not. You bring principles, assumptions, all these things to Scripture, and you read the Bible through the lens of these tools. The question is, are your tools biblical? Everybody brings tools, but are they biblical? Well, because the Bible is our highest authority, you have to make sure your tools come from the Bible itself. It makes sense that that we have to make sense of the Bible on its own terms. And so this means asking, what does the Bible say about how it wants to be read and interpreted? Well, our text gives us a key hermeneutical insight, and it's this. It's the first point this morning. Interpreting the Old Testament in light of the New Testament shows you that the Bible tells one story of salvation in Jesus Christ. If you're to read your Bible, then, in the way that God wants you to read your Bible, you must have this important principle in place. Where do we get it from? Well, you see this by the fact that Mark connects this new era of the Gospel, this new age, he connects that directly to the Old Testament Scriptures. He's showing you that, that even though the Bible is made up of 66 individual books, and even though there are many stories within these books, the stories in these books are all part of one unified, overarching story that is focused on the saving work of Jesus Christ. And so in light of our text, this means that you should view the entire Old Testament as the age of promise. Okay, There are all these promises in the Old Testament about the Messiah, His birth, even where He would be born, about His life, his death, his resurrection. There are all these prophecies about his kingdom, his people, all the blessings of salvation that would accompany his arrival in this world. And so that Old Testament age of promise is progressively moving forward to another age. It's pointing forward to this messianic age, the age of fulfillment, which we call the New Testament. The Old Testament then is like a seed and it grows as time unfolds until it blossoms fully in the New Testament. The Israelites were looking to the future with hope, eagerly anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises to them, promises which center on the coming of the Christ, who would establish His kingdom, who would subdue His enemies and save His people, thereby restoring Israel to its glory. Mark says the fulfillment of these promises began with the ministry of John the Baptist, showing you that you must interpret the Old Testament, friends, in light of the New Testament. Now, for those of you who've grown up 
uh, in this church or another Reformed church, you've been in Reformed circles for a while, this point might sound so obvious to you that it's not worth mentioning. But really, it's easy to say it's obvious when you've been swimming in this teaching for a while, for many years. There are a lot of other folks who who don't read their Bibles in this way as one unified story. One thing to remember is that while this division between Old and New Testaments, while it's in some ways helpful, it can also be misleading in other ways. How so? Well, it can lead some to conclude that the Bible is essentially telling two stories. One for the Jews in Israel, and another story about Christians in the church. And if you, being a 21st century Christian, adopt this kind of thinking, then what story would you say most applies to you? Well, of course, the New Testament story, right? Because you're a Christian, you're part of the church. And so the result is that you largely see the Old Testament as just irrelevant to your life. Maybe you'll read a psalm every now and then for a bit of encouragement, or, or perhaps you'll look to some of the Old Testament stories like David and Goliath or Daniel and the lion's den for a bit of moral inspiration. But for the most part, you steer clear of over half of your Bible because the Old Testament's for the Jews, and well, you're not a Jew. You're a Christian. This is the kind of thinking that's infused within what's called dispensationalism. Okay, dispensationalism is an overarching framework of biblical interpretation. There's a lot to the system that I won't go into, but inherent to the system is a very literalistic reading of the biblical text, including those Old Testament promises and prophecies. So if you think about those Old Testament promises made to Abraham, made to David, the promises and the prophets about God restoring Israel through the Messiah, all of these are interpreted literally, which means you end up not with one story of salvation, but two stories of salvation. One for Old Testament Israel, and another for the New Testament church. This literal reading of Old Testament promises and prophecies creates this sharp division between Israel and the church, and so God really has two separate people groups, each with their own plan of redemption. Now, maybe this sounds familiar to some of you because you were raised in a church uh, that used to teach this. Now, thankfully, dispensationalism is falling out of favor in academic circles and seminaries because it's just, well, not defensible biblically, but it's still alive in many churches, and it's alive on a popular popular level, especially in politics. Um, For instance, you'll often hear Republicans talk about Israel in a way like it's still God's holy nation. Okay, like the land still has, the land over there in the Middle East still has some spiritual significance, and they'll say Christians therefore need to support Israel because of all the things that God says about Israel in the Old Testament. This comes from dispensationalism. But even if you're not a card-carrying dispensationalist, a lot of believers still drive this huge wedge between the Testaments. They'll say things like, we're New Testament Christians, Or pastors who embrace this kind of thing will say, well, we're a New Testament church. They don't talk about the Old Testament much because, well, that was the time of the law. And in the New Testament, we're under the time of grace. Huge numbers of believers just jettison the Old Testament because why would I care about that part of the Bible when it wasn't written for me? In fact, one prominent evangelical pastor, Andy Stanley, wrote a book entitled Irresistible where he argues that we need to unhitch our Christianity from the Old Testament. We need to do this, he says, because one of the main reasons unbelievers are not coming to faith in Christ is because they have problems with the Old Testament. They don't like what they read in the Old Testament. They don't like how Christians cite the Old Testament to defend their faith, to make moral claims. And so the solution is to just get rid of the Old Testament and rely exclusively on the New Testament in preaching and evangelism. Andy Stanley argues that the Old Testament was just written for Israel anyway. It's, it's only about the Jews, it's only about their covenant relationship with God, which has led him even to dismiss the Ten Commandments. They have no binding authority on Christians, since they too are in that old part of the Bible. Now while there are likely a variety of things that motivated Stanley to write that book, one contributing factor to his radical views is that he doesn't embrace that hermeneutical principle here 
in our passage. He does not interpret the old in light of the new. And so at least on a practical level, he doesn't really believe that the Bible tells one story of salvation in Jesus Christ. You see, without that hermeneutical tool in place, you will not read or interpret your Bible the way God wants you to. You won't value the Old Testament like you value the New Testament, and the consequences, as you can see, can be quite severe. And now this isn't to say that the Old Testament's always easy to understand. It's not to negate the fact that, that parts of the Old Testament applied uniquely to Israel in ways that, that they don't apply to us. The simple point of our text, though, is, is the same point that Jesus made to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He was walking with two of his followers who were totally disillusioned by his death. They didn't recognize him. And, and rather than, than Jesus putting his arm around them and just saying, there, there, it'll be okay, everything is fine, what does Jesus do? Luke 24 records this. Jesus rebukes them. He even insults them. He says they're foolish. Why? Because they didn't know their Old Testament. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? The implication is that if they had known what the Old Testament taught, they would have been rejoicing, not mourning. And then in the very next verse, Luke says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to his two followers all the things in the scriptures concerning himself. That's exactly what Mark is doing in verses 2 and 3 of our text. Every word of the Bible, friends, contributes to the one story of God building his one kingdom of worshipers through the saving work of the one Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, both testaments are equally relevant to your Christian life. Okay, detour is over now. We're back on that main road with John the Baptist. Look with me at verses 4 to 8. And notice how John is described. He's no city slicker. He's living outside Jerusalem. He's in the wilderness. He's out in the elements. And he's clothed in camel's hair, wearing a leather belt, cooking up locusts putting honey on top of him like a condiment. I mean, the way he's described it, it coincides with Elijah, how Elijah is described in 2 Kings 1, which is just another line of evidence that John the Baptist fulfills this Elijah-like role. But what you can see is that this is a rugged guy, okay? But he's a rugged guy on mission. He was uniquely set apart by the Lord before he was even born as, as the one who would essentially roll out the red carpet for the Messiah. William Lane puts it well in his commentary on Mark. Lane says that John the Baptist is a crucial figure in the history of revelation and redemption. In retrospect, his appearance in the wilderness was the most important event in the life of Israel for more than 300 years. John's appearance signified that the decisive turning point in the history of salvation was at hand. To speak of the gospel of Jesus is to speak of the good news which began with John. And so, John's ministry is inseparably tied then to the ministry of Jesus Christ. In this way, John is unique among the prophets. I mean, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he's unique because unlike those other prophets, he ministered to God's people at the very birth of the age of fulfillment, of the messianic age. And he didn't just get to see the Messiah, but after our text, we find out he actually baptized the Messiah. I mean, John had the privilege of baptizing Jesus Christ. And so you can think of John's ministry and its relationship to Christ, you can think of John's ministry really as preparatory. He's the Elijah-like prophet who was divinely commissioned to prepare the Jews for the imminent arrival of the Christ. And you see this in verses 7 and 8 where he says to the Jews, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so because the Messiah is God himself, he won't baptize with water like John, but with the Holy Spirit, which isn't just referring to the experiential event of the new birth when the Spirit comes into your life and, and breathes new life into your soul. 
No, John's also alluding to the historical event when Jesus, as the risen and ascended Messiah, when he poured out his Spirit upon believers at Pentecost, forming the New Testament church and filling them with spiritual power so that they can make disciples of the nations. And so it's clear that John's preparatory ministry involves proclaiming the gospel. He's announcing the good news of the Messiah who's who's come to establish his kingdom and work salvation and pour out his spirit upon his people in a way that has never been seen before in the history of redemption. And John's ministry, as you can see, is also one of baptizing. I mean, he's called John the Baptist for a reason, sometimes just called uh, the baptizer, John the baptizer. He's baptizing people in the Jordan left and right, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But one thing you shouldn't miss about his ministry is its context. Okay, his ministry takes place in the wilderness. It's not an insignificant detail. As the Jews were in the wilderness, listening to John's preaching and getting baptized, it would have reminded them of the Exodus. It would have reminded them of how God rescued their forefathers from the Egyptians, how Moses led them out of captivity and into the wilderness how they were baptized in the Red Sea and consecrated by God as his holy nation and a people for his own possession. That the forerunner to the Messiah is carrying out his ministry in the wilderness preaches a clear message to the Jews. It tells them that as great as the Exodus was, it was but this earthly shadow of the salvation the Messiah would accomplish for you. God is coming to save you again, but this time he's not going to do it through another Moses. This time he's sending the Christ, his chosen Messiah, who will lead you in this greater exodus, who will baptize you in a way that far surpasses the Red Sea, in a way that merely is symbolized by the water of the Jordan River. Prepare for the coming of your Redeemer. That's the message of John the Baptist. He's announcing good news. And in light of that good news, he calls God's people to action, to preparation. The question is, how do they prepare? What practical thing should God's people do to get ready for the coming of their king? Well, John says one thing. Repent. Repent. This was the focus of John's ministry. His ministry of preaching and baptizing is focused on repentance. You see this in verses 4 and 5, that he proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And so in light of the good news of the Messiah, John called the Jews to examine their hearts, to look at their lives, take an inventory of their sins, turn from their evil ways and trust in the forgiveness of God because there is no salvation apart from repentance. Okay, this is about heart change. That's what John was preaching, heart change. This is about getting the heart ready for Jesus. The heart can't be adequately prepared for Christ unless it's first humbled and broken by sin. And so those who were grieved by their sin who confessed it, who turned away from it and trusted in the mercies of God, they were ready for the Lord. Their hearts were in the right place. And John baptized them in the Jordan, which didn't cause, don't misunderstand the text, it's not as if baptism caused God to forgive them. No, because forgiveness is an act of divine grace that no sinner can earn, no sinner is worthy of it. Baptism was instead the outward sign that symbolized that one's sins were washed away, that his heart was in the right place, and that he was now consecrated to the Lord. Friends, this was John's ministry. He preached the gospel, called sinners to repentance and faith, and baptized them, all in preparation for the coming of the Christ. The question now is, what does any of this have to do with us? We who do not anticipate the first coming of Christ, no, but the second coming of Christ. Well, there are two things I want to draw out, and the first is about baptism. You know, a lot of people wonder 
when they get to this text, they see John's baptism. Would those baptized by John have to get rebaptized as Christians? Maybe you've wondered that yourself before. The answer is yes, and we actually have an example of that in the beginning of Acts 19. But why? Why the need to get rebaptized? Well, John was the last prophet of the Old Covenant era, and so his baptism was technically an Old Covenant baptism, a baptism of preparation, which means it wasn't a Christian baptism. Nevertheless, the substance of John's baptism is very similar to Christian baptism. And you can note the similarities in language between our passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter tells the Jews to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so here again, we see the ideas of repentance and baptism, forgiveness and the Spirit, all tied together in Acts chapter 2, just as they are in our passage. So there's similarities there, but despite those similarities, the key difference between John's baptism and Christian baptism is where they occur on the timeline of redemptive history. Okay, John's baptism pointed forward to the coming Messiah, whereas your baptism, brothers and sisters, points backward to the Messiah who came. Why does this matter? Because your baptism, friends, assures you that the Messiah did, in fact, accomplish salvation, and not just for the Jews and for Israel, but for you as he was crucified for your sins and raised for your justification. Your new covenant baptism that Jesus himself instituted assures you that, that just as water washes away dirt from the body, he has washed away the guilty stains of you who believe. Your baptism reminds you that the promised outpouring of the Spirit in verse 8 is a promise that was fulfilled not only in Acts 2, but in your own life as the Spirit came upon you in power, as He subdued your rebellious, wicked heart, worked within you repentance and faith that you might turn from your sin and rest in Christ alone for salvation. The promised Spirit who presently indwells you says the Apostle Paul, is the Spirit who also seals you, marking you off as one of God's holy and beloved children, thereby guaranteeing that you will receive the fullness of your heavenly inheritance in the day of Christ. Friends, what I'm saying is that you've received a better baptism than the baptism of John because your baptism testifies not to the unfinished work of Christ but to the finished work of Christ. John's baptism was one of promise. Yours is a baptism of fulfillment. John's baptism said, here's what the Messiah will do, whereas yours says, here's what the Messiah has done. This is important to grasp because Scripture likens our Christian experience to that of life in the wilderness, the kind of wilderness that Israel traveled through after the Exodus. Remember where John's ministry takes place in the wilderness. This is very intentional. The Bible describes the Christian life as life in the wilderness, and we know that life in the wilderness is full of many dangers, toils, and snares, as the great hymn says. There are many things in our lives and things happening around the world that discourage us, things that snuff out our joy, things that give us anxiety and cause us to lose hope. This is why it's so critical that you grasp that point here about your baptism. Maybe you were baptized a long time ago, even as a baby, and you, you can't remember it, but that doesn't matter here. The point is that your baptism has enduring relevance because it visibly testifies to the promises that God has made to you, his sons and daughters. Within this messy world, baptism is, is God's pledge to you that the gospel promised in our text has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Messiah who came, who accomplished all his Father's will, who has led you in a greater exodus out of sin and death, who's present with you in the darkest valleys of your life, and who will sustain you to the very end of your race when you were taken up into the glory of heaven. Your baptism is a gift from God and it's a constant reminder of his unending love. And so in the wilderness of this life, don't neglect the relevance 
of that sacrament as an abiding source of gospel comfort given from God to you, his weary pilgrim people. Now finally, I'm going to start to land this plane by briefly touching on the focus of John's ministry. As I just said, the Savior promised in our text is the Savior who came. He was crucified, buried, raised, and he ascended into heaven. He's presently seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is our confession, as you know, as the one holy Catholic apostolic church. We look not just to the first coming of Christ. He already came. We look to his second coming, when he'll gather his elect, judge the world in righteousness, and consummate his kingdom reign that began 2,000 years ago. And yet, despite that, that covenantal separation, you might say, between us and the Jews in our passage, not to mention the separation in, in time, geography, and, and culture, we find ourselves still in a similar situation as those in our text, asking the same question. How should we prepare for the coming of the Lord? As we await the appearing, the appearing of Christ, there, there are a lot of good things that occupy our time and our attention. There are a lot of ways that Christians serve the church. There are a lot of ways you might be engaged in serving others. There are a lot of things that you do, friends, in the name of Jesus and to the glory of God. But our text calls us to focus on one thing, not to the exclusion of the other good things, but to prioritize, rather, this one thing, and that's living a life of repentance. In Psalm 51, David says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Of all the sacrifices that we make in the name of Christ, of all the good things we do, friends, to the glory of God the Father, what he most delights in is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And so is your heart softened to sin, or is it hardened by it? Is your mind sensitive to sin or desensitized to it? Is your conscience burdened by your sin or seared by your sin? Do you grieve over your sin, or do you, do you only grieve when, when your sin gets exposed, brought into the light? If you examine your daily habits and routines, does confession have a prominent place? Does it have a place at all? When you go before the throne of grace, how much time do you spend confessing your sins versus the other time asking God to bless you in some way? Our petitions for blessing are often many while our confessions of sin are often too few. Why is this? Well, the reality is that we all make time for the things that are important to us. It's an unavoidable truth of life, isn't it? And so if you don't spend time each day owning up to your sins, asking the Lord to forgive you and for the strength to put your sins to death, then repentance simply isn't that important to you. And it is, what is evident is that what's important to you is yourself. But notice what John says in verse 7. After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. It's apparent that, that even though John had a very large following, right? You get that picture in our text, that he was a celebrity of sorts with the people. It's apparent that he thought of himself as a nobody. His ministry wasn't about him. He was just the messenger and he knew it. He wasn't trying to make himself great in the eyes of others. He didn't care about fame and popularity and his status with the people. It's evident not just from our text, but from the Gospel of John, where John the Baptist says, he, meaning Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's what John said about his Savior. John was not the hero of his own story. Jesus was the hero of John's story. John's life and ministry were all about shining the spotlight on Christ. And so, friends, if, if repentance doesn't hold a prominent place in your life, you have to ask yourself, who is the hero of my story? Who's really at the center of my life? John didn't live for himself. But what about you? What about you? 
Now, how can you tell? And we'll consider these questions. Do you crave attention? Do you want others to notice you? Maybe even wearing certain things or acting a certain way or saying certain things so that people will notice you, compliment you, and praise you. What does your social media activity say about you and your desire for attention? Are you constantly posting things because you want some kind of affirmation? Do you expect people to cater to your every demand? Do you lash out in anger even when the smallest of your expectations aren't met? Are you preoccupied with what people think of you? Perhaps you're someone who holds grudges, who stews in bitterness and refuses to forgive even for minor offenses. Maybe you're easily defensive. You can't handle the slightest bit of criticism. Are you one who never admits that you're wrong? Do you pass the blame when things go wrong, but take credit when things go right? Or perhaps you're just bucking at God's will in some way, knowingly and intentionally engaging in sin because, well, what you want matters more than what Jesus wants. All of this, all of these things help to to unearth the truth, which is that pride is a sneaky, sneaky sin that often lurks within the deepest recesses of our hearts. The reality, friends, is that we all like to be great in the eyes of others. We all think highly of ourselves, assuming the best of our intentions while assuming the worst of others. We downplay our own sin, thinking that we're better than we really are. And so like those in our passage, what you need to do this morning is take an inventory of your sin, especially of your pride. One of the distinct marks of one who's been baptized with the Spirit is that he hates his sin his own sin more than anything else. And he repents of it, especially his pride, because pride steals that spotlight that belongs on Jesus alone, and it puts it on self. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And yet, as great as John was, even Jesus saying how great John was, John knew he was not the hero of his own story. Like him, we all have our own stories, but, but humility demands recognizing that our stories are all part of God's one story that he is telling, a story that centers on his son, Jesus Christ. As you await his coming, make the best use of the time by installing within your daily routine the practice of genuine, heartfelt repentance because the heart can't be prepared for Christ unless it's first humbled and broken by sin. With this in mind, I want to close by calling to repentance any here who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. In verse 3, John says, the Lord is coming. Take note of that. What you need to know about Jesus is that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and as Lord, he is supremely and absolutely holy. Many churches do not preach on the, the lordship of Christ. They preach a soft and a weak Jesus who functions as nothing more really than just this appendage to your life who tags along for whatever ride you want to take him on. He's one who bows to your demands, who takes care of all your problems and coaches you whenever life gets you down. He's a Jesus who exists for you. But that is not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not the Jesus of reality. That is a fictional God created by man's sinful imagination. The Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus preached by John the Baptist is the Jesus who is utterly holy and who commands all people everywhere to repent of their sin, including you. In your pride, you have defied this Lord and made yourself Lord. Rather than living for Christ's glory, you live for your own glory. Rather than worshiping Him, you worship yourself. Rather than making your life about Jesus, you've made your life about you, about whatever makes you happy. This is sin. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the Lord is coming to deal the final death blow 
to all those who have not repented of their sin and bowed their knees in faith to Jesus Christ. He is coming to deal that death blow to those who are unprepared. So you've heard the gospel this morning. The good news about the Christ who came, who lived, who died, who rose again, who defeated sin and death, and offers forgiveness and life everlasting to all who turn from their sin and bow in faith. If you are relying on your own efforts, the good things you do, your affiliation with this church or with another church, if you're relying on your baptism, your ties to your Christian family, or whatever else to make you right with God, you are doomed. Because salvation from Christ is only found in Christ. And there is no salvation apart from repentance. You can't have your sins forgiven if you're unwilling to give them up. You can't have Jesus without first letting go of the sin you love. Your allegiance cannot be divided uh, between Jesus and, and yourself. And yet a lot of people think this. A lot of people operate this way. They think they can do this. They essentially want half of Jesus. They want him as Savior, but they don't want him as Lord. Because why? They still want to be Lord. So they get to keep their sin, they think, and just live however they want, all while thinking that they're okay with Jesus, that he's forgiven uh, them, that, that he's punched their ticket to heaven. But that's not what you get in our text. That's not the picture that you see here in these eight verses. Those who think and live this way are deceived and still under judgment because there is no salvation apart from repentance. And now don't misunderstand me, please. Repentance is not a call to perfection. There's not a perfect person in this room. No Christians without sin. Repentance, rather, is a change of heart. It's an internal, think of it as an internal relinquishing of the throne. It's an admission of guilt before a holy God, and it's turning away from sin in your life of rebellion and turning toward Jesus, trusting Him as your Savior, and endeavoring now to follow Him as the only Lord of your life. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is Lord whether any of us recognizes it or not. And the Lord is coming. And so if you're not right with Him, don't put this off. If you are still breathing, that means there's still time. You still have time to get your heart right and ready. Repent, turn to Him, trust that His death on the cross washes away your sins and surrender yourself entirely to His Lordship to follow Him and not the sinful desires of your heart. This is the truth that you've heard this morning. And as Jesus himself says, the truth will set you free. Let's pray.